Today's episode is pulled from the Patreon private lecture archives. It's from 2019, and it's a really fascinating study that I did that I want to share with everyone here on the channel. It's a look at Jimi Hendrix's gear, specifically his pedals, and how technology evolved at the exact moments in his career, and it poses the question, did these effects and new sounds make him famous, or did he make them famous? It's a really fun thing to look at, so let's jump right into it. So Hendrix was born Johnny Allen Hendrix, November 27th of 1942, and he died September 18th of 1970. He started playing guitar at the age of 15, and he's from Seattle, Washington. Um, he goes into the military, he is discharged, and then he begins playing gigs. Um, so he gets on what's called the Chitlin Circuit, and this is in the South, and he plays with a lot of R&B and soul bands. Now, he doesn't yet move to England. This is, needs to be stated. A lot of people think Hendrix is English. He's American. He's playing the R&B circuit. Uh, people like uh, Little Richard, Isley Brothers. He's playing a, a lot of different gigs and he's a sideman. You can find a lot of pictures of him. If you Google Jimi Hendrix Chitlin Circuit or Jimi Hendrix Sideman, you'll see some fun photos. But he's mainly playing with Curtis Knight and the Squires. And where this whole thought process starts that I want to talk to you about is the technology that he uses. So let's jump into that. So as his career um, basically starts in 62 and it goes through 70, there are some pretty major events that correspond with his musical career. Now, he has 24 singles that he releases in that time uh, with R&B acts that I mentioned, Isley Brothers, Little Richard, Curtis Knight, and then he has the four major solo releases. Um, there's three experience releases, and then there's other releases, and here they are. Um, there's actually a single, so there's five major releases that I'm categorizing here in his career. The first major release, and the first release ever, was the Hey Joe single. That was December 16th of 1966. The B-side was Stone Free, and this was only in the UK. So Hendrix is in America, playing this Chitlin circuit. He is a side man, and people keep encouraging him to go out on his own. And there's a very interesting dynamic there. I can't get into all of it, but there's some really influential people that looked at him and said, hey, you should try to sing. And he's like, I can't sing, stuff like that. But he finally moves to the UK when a lady named Linda Keefe kind of finds him and introduces him to the guy that would become his manager. And it was the bass player for a band called The Animals. You might know an old classic rock hit, House of the Rising Sun. Well, that was The Animals. And this guy was in The Animals. They were on an American tour and he wanted out of the band and he wanted to become a manager. He sees Hendrix, takes him to England and makes him famous in England. So an American guy playing this Chitlin circuit is taken to England, becomes famous. And that's where all this starts. And the first single is Hey Joe. Uh, it's a cover. And Stone Free is on the B-side. Then he puts out his first album, uh, May 12th, 1967, Are You Experienced? So that's the first experience record. It's a trio. And that is the majority of his music was done with this band. Uh, there's later a U.S. release. The next release is Acts as Bold as Love in December 1st, 1967. Uh, then you have Ladyland in 68, and Band of Gypsies, which is not the experience, but it has to be included here for the technology and effects and gear reasons I'm about to go through. That is um, right before his death, 1970. So Jimmy's career drastically follows the technology of the 60s year by year and sound by sound. So I'm going to lay this out for you. I think you're going to like it. Let's start it up. So let's talk about Marshall. Um, there has to be, before I get into pedals, the discussion of what I'm going to call the Marshall Factor. Now Marshall was Jim Marshall, a drummer, who was importing Fender products to the UK and it was very expensive to import. 
He has a couple sidekicks. They convince him, hey, let's build the Fender Baseman, one of his most popular imported amps. Let's build that 59 Baseman and put your name on it. It'll be way cheaper. So they clone it, build it, but it sounds a bit different because of the parts they're having to use. And this becomes Marshall. Now, what's really interesting here is that Hendrix, his career starts 1966 as a solo artist at the exact same time that the Marshall amp as we know it becomes a thing. So you have seen the What is a Blues Breaker episode, hopefully. If you haven't, go watch that. But Eric Clapton records a record with John Mayle, and it's called Blues Breakers. And Eric Clapton makes Marshall Amps a household name with this record. It's considered the greatest British blues album ever made. Eric Clapton, um, a guy who was playing with a lot of people, joins this blues band and he brings American blues to the UK in a very loud and powerful way by turning up the Marshall Blues Breaker amp. Now this amp was a JTM 45, which essentially is the basis of all Marshall kind of heads. It's a modified Fender thing, and it was a combo that Clapton used there, but Clapton went on with Cream that same year and, and later and used the stacks. And then Marshall uh, stacks are seen behind Jimi Hendrix. Now Jimi purchases uh, two or three Super 100 Marshall heads and four 4x12 four cabinets from Jim Marshall in the fall of 66. He's seen using them on a short French tour October 13th of 66, um, and these were the first experience shows ever. So Jimi Hendrix is tracking a record, records the record, gets two guys in his band, the experience, buys Marshall amps, and the first tour later, the first, the first tour is immediately after this purchase. So his live career starts the moment he buys Marshall amps and right as Eric Clapton has made the Marshall Amps famous. So undoubtedly, Hendrix, there's a lot of interviews where Hendrix talks about wanting to meet Clapton. Uh, he was so excited to go to the UK. He asked that original manager, hey, am I going to get to meet Clapton? There's stories where he goes out on the stage with Clapton, or God, as they called Clapton, and he, you know, they do a duel and Hendrix wins. There's a story where Clapton's on the side of the stage uh, trying to light a cigarette and his hands are shaking because Hendrix is so incredible and he joined Cream on stage and kind of blew Clapton away. And so there's these really amazing dynamics where Clapton introduces the Marshall thing and then Hendrix gets the Marshalls, starts the tour, and his primary live sound and studio sound was kind of based around that cranked, crank kind of thing. Um, Jimmy came along at the same time that these Marshalls were released, and here's a quote from Jimmy. I really like my old Marshall tube amp because when it's working properly, there's nothing that can beat it. Nothing in the whole world. It looks like two refrigerators hooked together. Really fascinating. So there's also a story a little earlier where he sets in with a band called Trinity in London, and he just walks up on the stage He's, he doesn't have an amp there, but he has his guitar, and he walks over and dimes the Marshall amp and just plays. He tells them, hey, go into Hey Joe. This is right before his single is released, and everyone's stunned. Uh, people, basically, their jaw had dropped because in England, people were trying to play. Primarily, these white bluesmen were playing American blues music that was coming from a black culture, like B.B. King, uh, muddy waters and walks this uh, uh, black American onto the stage, dimes the marshal, and plays Hey Joe and is the real thing in front of them. It was a pretty amazing moment. So Marshall is tied into the sound of Hendrix. And now let's get into the pedals. We're rolling. Pedals start with Hendrix. Um, in May of 1966, he borrows this pedal, the Maestro Fuzz Tone. This is the first fuzz pedal ever created, and Hendrix couldn't afford one, but he's playing um, you know, in the Chitlin circuit, and he's with Curtis Knight, and he borrows this for a couple of weeks, and basically he gets his first taste of experimenting with feedback and loud sustain, and he's working it into his routine, and the band doesn't like it because 
up until that point, feedback was a technical error. Like you didn't want feedback. And so he's creating this live sound that's really crazy. There's a photo of Jimmy in New York City at the Cheetah Club, and this is at his feet. So the first manufactured fuzz ever in 62, it reaches him four years later, and he gets his first taste of fuzz. Here's a quote from Mike Bloomfield. Uh, he played on Dylan's records like Howie 61, uh, the Mike Bloomfield blues band, really great player. This is what he says about the first time he saw Jimi Hendrix. He says, the first time I saw Jimmy play, he was Jimmy James with the Blue Flames. So that was Jimmy's original solo band in America before he went to the UK. I was performing with Paul Butterfield and I was the hot shot guitarist on the block. I thought I was it. I'd never heard of Hendrix. Then someone said, you got to see this guitar player with John Hammond. I was at the Cafe Agogo, and he was at the Night Owl or the Cafe Wa. I went across the street and saw him. Hendrix knew who I was, and that day in front of my eyes, he burned me to death. I didn't even get my guitar out. H-bombs were going off, guided missiles were flying. I can't tell you the sounds he was getting out of his instrument. He was getting every sound I was ever to hear him get right there in that room with a Stratocaster, a twin, Fender twin, a Maestro fuzz, and that was it. How he did this, I wish I understood. He just got right up in my face with his guitar, and I didn't even want to pick up my guitar for the next year. So Hendrix starts his career in 66. This had been out a few years, and this is his first dabble in effects pedals. This is pre-experience. So now we move on to 1966, later that year. He ends up in England uh, in the winter of 66, and this pedal is released. Um, the Dallas Arbiter Fuzzface comes out that year as he shows up in London. So Hendrix is taken to London to become famous, and this is released in London the exact moment he arrives in London. So kind of catch the timeline there. The earliest photo of Jimmy with this fuzz face comes from the Big Apple Club in Munich, Germany on November 8th. Um, his playing enthralled the audience so much so um, that they pulled him off the stage and broke his guitar. And this furthered Jimmy to grab the guitar. They broke the neck. He grabs it and starts bashing it on the stage. And a lot of people say that it was because he was using fuzz. It was such a new sound. Um, it's hard for us because we heard fuzz and distortion, but you got a picture of this guy playing blues, psychedelic blues is in Germany. People haven't heard this kind of stuff. And this is a prime ingredient for the volume and crazy distortion, the feedback, the way that he played and filled up the stage. It got him so excited and it was such a crazy show. They pull him off the stage, break his guitar, and then he destroys his guitar. Um, so his first recorded uh, track with the fuzz face is November 24th of 66, Love or Confusion. So you can go listen to that. So in June of 68, uh, Life magazine, uh, Frank Zappa informed everyone who wanted to sound like Jimmy. Frank Zappa said, if you want to sound like Jimmy, he says, buy a Fender Stratocaster, an Arbiter fuzz face, a Vox Wah and four Marshall amps. It was through this article that the world learned of that fuzz face. So Marshall, Maestro, fuzz face, like perfectly on the dot. Every move Jimmy's making is lining up with a significant technological creation in guitar. It's really, really wild. Then we have a really, really great um, situation that happens to Jimmy. He meets a guy named Roger Mayer. So it's January 11th of 1967. Jimmy meets Roger Mayer at the Bag and Nels Club in Soho. That club's still there. I stopped by last time I was in London. If you're ever there, go check it out. It's really cool to stand there. So Roger was a naval acoustic engineer who worked for the British Navy, and he had a hobby of modifying and making guitar pedals. So he takes these to Jimmy. He had made some stuff already for Jimmy Page, who was a session player at the time, and Jeff Beck of the Yardbirds. Jimmy was in the Yardbirds as well. Um, so this is pre-Led Zeppelin and all that. So a week after meeting Jimmy at the Baganels, uh, Mayer goes to another show at the Chiselhurst Caves, and he ends up backstage with Jimmy, and he hands him a brand new prototype. And, and Roger calls it Octavia. It's something he invented 
Jimmy was finishing up a full-length album, and then he, he loved this effect so much that he invites Roger over to Olympic Studios to finish up tracking uh, the final guitar parts for his first album. So this is right before, this is after the Hey Joe single, and right before the Experience record. So that pedal, uh, essentially, it was cloned by this company, Octavia, uh, it's very similar sound, has a transformer. But Roger Mayer, later in the 80s, started manufacturing a lot of his pedals. They're in these spaceship enclosures. Um, but the one Jimmy had was in a, a different casing, and it uh, basically disappeared off the face of the earth. And but So this effect is a big deal because Jimmy likes it so much that after playing it in the back room of this gig on a small amp, he says, Roger, meet me at the studio. I want to finish up some tracking and he tracks purple haze and fire using the octavia so if you listen to those tracks put on headphones and listen to this high octave up so it's a fuzz and there's a high octave above it and it's amazing and it was the first time this effect was ever used so hendrix once again this is the first time it's ever used he ends up on his first record using this brand new effect. So technology met him there once again. So it's really crazy. Everywhere he's going, something new is happening. Um, basically, Roger Mayer says that the first proto unit was weak and Jimmy would have to use a fuzz with it. And then later he revised it to have the fuzz in it. There's a bunch of stuff there, not really important, but basically this pedal evolved over the years. Even after Jimmy uh, had passed away, Roger kept modifying this. Um, Jimmy would call Roger Mayer the secret of my sound. He said that several times in interviews. So Jimmy's Octavia era came to an end in Madison, Wisconsin on May 2nd of 1970 before his death. It's unclear whether that original proto unit was stolen or broken, but it never entered the signal chain again. There's no photographs or anything. So it could have been stolen. He was also tired of playing a lot of the experience stuff. He was in the band of gypsies and doing other things and Purple Haze and songs like that. He didn't want to play them anymore. So anyway, that's pretty significant. That's an amazing effect that was copied over and over. Now, next is one of the biggest effects. So we're in February 20th of 67 and Jimmy recorded I Don't Live Today. Now, this session was the first time that Hendrix used the wah effect. Now, hold on. Don't think wah-wah, just know wah effect. He says, Clapton had released Disraeli Gears with Cream a month later, uh, and he says, the first record I heard the wah-wah was Tells of a Brave Ulysses. So Hendrix says, I heard Cream, Clapton, use it on that. That was June 67, as a flip side of the Strange Brew single by Cream. Noted Jimmy, it's a very groovy sound. But on Are You Experienced, I Don't Live Today recorded February 20th, 67. There's a talking wah guitar solo, uh, but we used a hand wah, which sounds very good. We were doing it with our hands. So then Vox and this other company in the States in California, they made a foot pedal thing. We released a record about two or three days after Cream came out. It was coincidental because we didn't know anything about their record and they didn't know anything about ours. So once again, technology meets Hendrix in 67. There's a bunch of theories as to how Hendrix gets a hold of a wah for the first time. Uh, so he supposedly in 1967 sees Frank, Frank Zappa on, in July playing in New York City and goes and buys a wah immediately after the show. There's other theories um, where Noel Redding says Jimmy got interested in the wah in London. So this would have been before that Frank Zappa show. This is when they're still in London. And basically he's like, yeah, there was a store on Charing Cross Road. That's where guitar shops were. I used to go and hang out and had nothing else to do. This one guy found out I was playing with the experience and he said, we got this new thing. It was called a crybaby in that store. And so he said, bring, bring Jimmy in. So he got Jimmy in, tried it out, and he had one at that point. So it's a bit of a mystery. Uh, there's some other speculation as well. The first known photo of Hendrix using a wah is August 15th, 67 in Ann Arbor. A track two of Axis, so the, the second album, Jimmy wastes no time using the wah. The first song is like this uh, atmospheric kind of, uh, 
experimental track and the second song is really the first song and Wah is immediately on it. So 67, the Wah is out, Jimmy's 67 release, Wah is in the first song. Um, so once again, technology meeting Jimi Hendrix. Now we know about this, the fuzz face, and there's another little predicament here. So Roger Mayer was continually tweaking and designing effects for Jimmy through his career. Roger states that he worked on several mods for these Arbiter fuzz faces to achieve specific sounds and needs that Jimmy wanted in the live and studio environment. So in the late 60s, you have to realize you can't go buy a pedal enclosure. You just can't get on Google and do that. So Roger would take these enclosures gut the circuit out and put his own fuzz circuits, his own modified versions of fuzz faces, his own fuzz circuits. And these were all over. And so when we're looking at certain pictures of Hendrix past 67, we actually don't know what's in these. You can't look at a picture of Hendrix and say, that's a fuzz face. We're not really sure. Uh, Roger Mayer calls this the Axis fuzz. So Axis Bold as Love is Hendrix's second record. And, and he named his fuzz circuit design after Axis. And it would be the primary fuzz used on that whole album and through the end of his career. So even in the Axis sessions, you see pictures of a fuzz face. It's actually Roger Mayer's Axis fuzz at that point. Um, Roger still worked for the British military and he couldn't go to every show, but he was Hendrix's tech, but he couldn't go to every show. And his job when he was at the shows was to collect the effects and guitars. And when he wasn't at some of those shows, the original like gutted Axis fuzzes were stolen. There's a lot of them that we don't know where they're at. Uh, even Mayer, he can't remember certain details about what he actually did. Uh, it's really tough to remember that stuff, you know, 50 years later. So there's a little bit of mystery as to what exactly Hendrix is playing on Axis or certain songs because he was always tweaking these pedals and then they get stolen and there's no record of it. Um, pretty interesting stuff. Next up is the Big Muff Mystery. Mike Matthews, the creator of Electro Harmonics, Mike knew Jimmy back when he was Jimmy James playing the Chitlin Circuit. And so Jimmy would come through New York and uh, Mike was actually a band promoter and would book shows. So Mike Matthews, he was a really great uh, organ player, pianist in the day, and he played in some of these rock bands. He actually booked Curtis Knight, Jimi Hendrix, Jimmy James, and got to know all these guys, and they would hang out. Mike is one of the guys that told Jimmy you should sing and encouraged him. Mike believes he actually has a big part in play of Jimmy doing that, which is really cool. But basically, you know, he's a promoter. They become friends. When Jimmy returns from England back to New York, he's famous. He leaves New York and nobody really cares. But someone saw something in him there, took him to London. He becomes famous. And he, when he comes back, um, Mike is still friends with him. And he invites Mike to several sessions as they're tracking different things. This would have been the Electric Ladyland records. Um, this is like... 67 late 67 and 68 and mike says that he walked into manny's music in new york city and was told hey jimmy bought your fuzz now the problem here is that mike says hey jimmy had a big muff i went over to electric ladyland and there were the big muff he's recording with it this is what mike says but the issue is that these sessions were recorded in 67 68 and the Big Muff wasn't designed or released till 69. So there's some issue. I mean, Mike is probably not remembering the years correctly, things like that. But there's also a really interesting thing. I forgot something, hold on. I'm back. So what Mike probably saw, most definitely saw, was the Guild Foxy Lady. So in 67, 68, when the actual tracking of Ladyland was happening, the Big Muff didn't exist. But Mike, before Electroharmonics was ever thought of, was building fuzz pedals for Guild. So this is a Foxy Lady. It is a Mazrite Fuzzrite clone. And this is probably what was on the floor at that point. It's a little hard to say, but the mystery is really interesting. There's a photo that Eddie Kramer, the engineer, took from those sessions. And you can see 
a couple of these on the floor. One is in an unbranded box. It's like a prototype. So pretty fascinating. And, and then later, Mitch Mitchell of the experience, there was an experience gear collection and one of those was in it. So that's probably what Mike is referring to and what he actually saw. Uh, here's Mike's quote. I saw Jimmy using it in the studio, the Big Muff. He used to invite me to all his recording sessions when he was in New York. And one day, Henry at Manny's told me, hey, you just sold a Big Muff to Jimmy. I went down to show him something else. It was in the early Black Finger Distortion Free Sustainer, the compressor. And I saw he had the Big Muff on the floor. And I know uh, early on he used fuzz faces, but he did eventually use the Big Muff. This is really complicated and it's probably not exactly accurate. So this story was pushed further by Electro Harmonics in their marketing in the 70s. They, they called the Big Muff the electric lady sound. So it's really difficult because the years don't line up, but there is this information out there and we know that Jimmy probably had a Big Muff, you know, the V1 later on. This would have been the 1969 model. So this was around when Jimmy was in New York, he'd come back. Yeah, but we have no evidence that he actually used a real Big Muff first issue. Um, so if Jimmy did use an actual Big Muff, it would be on one of the songs recorded the last few months of 69 through 70 when this actually came out. Uh, and it lines up with the production dates of the original Big Muff I just held. And so the songs that it would be on are Midnight, Trash Man, Ships Passing in the Night, Easy Rider, Hear My Train It Coming, Keep on grooving, freedom with the power of God, earth blues, bleeding heart, message from nine to the universe, message to love, lover man, Isabella, burning desire, easy blues, machine gun, sky blues today, mastermind, room full of mirrors, stepping stone, dolly dagger, them changes, and power of soul. So a lot of band of gypsy stuff. So I don't know. I don't really hear it on there. So you listen to band of gypsies and some of that stuff and I don't know. You tell me what you think. I don't think it's on there. So Univibe. Uh, uh, there's a piece for a magazine called Record Mirror, and the writer Valerie Mab says, Hendrix is now using a strange new effect, which he had shown her during the interview. Um, the effect was reported to produce strange and otherworldly sounds that nobody had heard before on guitar, not even Jimmy himself. So this was a, released in 1968 by Shin Honey, they also had Jack's labels. It's all the same company and they would label it different ways. So this was released in 68, um, but we don't hear Jimmy using it till 69. It's a bit of a mystery. So several months, almost a year go by until we see him with it. So for some reason, I don't know, touring, session work or whatever, we have no evidence. There's no recordings. You have to realize a lot of this information is easy to spot because he recorded constantly, and those archives have been released with dates, and you just don't hear the Univibe. If he'd had one, he would have used it. So his first use of the Univibe is August 10th of 69, during a session 14 days before Woodstock. So they're in Woodstock, they're jamming. Woodstock had a pretty hip culture. Dylan lived there, a lot of artists, the band, and he's up there jamming. He apparently found the Univibe. Now, Roger says that the Univibe first appeared and he actually modified it. So actually all I had to do was find Unity says, I set it up a little different, Jimmy loved it. So Jimmy first used the Univibe on August 18th live. So the first live use is the 18th of August at Woodstock, Star Spangled Banner. So once again, Jimi Hendrix is right in the prime, looking for sounds, the Univibe's released. So it's pretty fascinating. Every step of the way, a new guitar pedal technology meets Jimi Hendrix, like right then. The Univibe is a few months late, but normally he had these things in his hand the moment they come out. Uh, it's really wild. Um, Jimmy appears later on the Dick Cavett show, which was like a, like a Johnny Carson type thing. There's some video of him setting and talking to Dick, but he plays Machine Gun. Uh, this song was recorded a couple months later with the Band of Gypsies, but that album was released uh, March 25th of 1970, and it's considered the prime demonstration of Hendrix and the Univibe. So we have a lot of crazy stuff here. We have the Univibe, 68 comes out right in the heat of Hendrix's career, the Fuzz Face, 
66, right in the heat. The Vox Wa 67, one of the first people to ever record with it. Hey, it's me from the future. I know more than I knew in 2019 when I filmed this, and here's something really cool I want to interject here. Hendrix actually owned a very strange guitar pedal that you never hear anyone talking about. Here's a receipt from a shop in London, 1967, where he bought a Super Fuzz. Um, but here's the problem. A Super Fuzz is one of these, right? You know, like the Univox Super Fuzz, it turned into this. That's not what he bought. The salesperson spelled it wrong. It's actually Super Fuzz. So he owned one of these. It's the first edition Marshall Super Fuzz. Uh, these are built by Color Sound at the time, which is right down the street. And here's a photo of him using it. We don't know much, it's 67, so he already had a fuzz face, but he has this. Maybe he lost his fuzz face, maybe it was stolen. Maybe he wanted to try it out, but we have a photo of him using it. So Hendrix used a tone bender. Who knew? He gets a hold of this. His career starts basically a couple years after the first fuzz pedals ever made. You have the big muff possibility in 69, right after Ladyland's recorded. You have the Roger Mayer stuff that happens right off the bat, right when he's in London. Um, this kid making effects for the first time and trying them. It's pretty nuts how the technology meets Hendrix. So my question to you guys, and let's put this in the comments and talk through it. Did Jimi Hendrix make pedals famous or did pedals help make him famous? It's a really fascinating chicken or the egg thought, little guitar pedal philosophy for you. That's something I've been thinking about. And um, I just wanna know what you think. How fascinating is it that he comes along and at the exact moment of every guitar pedal, technological advancement and invention, they're on his records almost immediately. And his very short career is fueled by these effects and the Marshall stuff as well. Thanks so much for watching this. I hope you enjoyed it. I know there were no demos, there were no riffs, there were no jams, but we don't need that every day. Sometimes you just need to listen to a nerd talk. And that's what you got. So if you liked it, hit like, subscribe to the channel, click the bell icon for future notifications, and go listen to some Hendrix and play a fuzz pedal really loud. Bye-bye.